So hello everyone and welcome to the fourth episode of Lifestyle Democracy. Here with us we have a special guest. Uh, his name is uh, Sean Fensom and he's been involved. He's from the United Kingdom and he's been involved for probably more than 30, 40 years in different uh, cooperative initiatives in the digital space, uh, including networks such as the Community Broadband Network, the Manchester Digital Trade Association, the Cooperative Network Infrastructure and Brighton Digital Exchange. If all of this sounds like a mouthful to you, I will actually allow uh, Mr. Sean Fensom to share more about his um, his experiences. And I'm sure that you will find uh, his uh, insights uh, very useful in thinking about how to engage or how to become involved in different cooperative initiatives. So without further ado, uh, I would like to ask you, Sean, thank you for taking the time today to interview. To Thank you for yourself. inviting me. Uh, we had a chance to meet in person back in uh, June and we had a lovely uh, chat. And I think that uh, uh, other viewers will also find uh, the insights you share inspiring. So I would just like to ask you, so can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became involved with cooperatives okay so um uh, i um i was one of the founders of a of a cooperative which became known as poptel uh, back in the 1980s uh which uh, evolved into one of the uk's first uh, internet service providers um and um made a bit of a name for itself B b by helping to launch the the dot co-op domain uh, top level domain which is now used by cooperatives all over the world which we did in partnership with um ncba in the united states and uh but also became known as a provider to labor movement organizations ngos human rights organizations you know across the world initially and then much more focused in the UK later. So um, now what, when we set uh, Poptel up, I think uh, for us, you know, the, 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 the vision, the central idea of it was the idea that online technology was, was the future, uh, was going to have a big impact on technology. So we're talking the mid 80s now when most people had never heard of the internet. Um, uh, we had a modem that ran at 300 bits per second, um, you know, whereas the connection I'm speaking to you on now runs at 650 megabits per second, at least in one direction. Um, so um, so the, things are very different in that respect. But uh, we felt that um, this technology, online technology, computers, communicating with computers was going to be you know, fundamental, uh, are going to have a fundamental impact on, on the world. So that was our, that was what we wanted to do. And when it came to qu the question, well, how shall we do it? What I think the idea that we would set up a business to, to do that, I don't know why that seemed like a sensible thing to uh, approach to take. <clears throat> and having decided that, I think the idea that it would be a cooperative and that we would all treat each other equally was kind of obvious, really. Uh, I couldn't really imagine doing it any other way. Um, but as time has gone on since then, I think I've more and more become of the view that um, you know, we have to shift the economy in the direction that cooperatives point across the planet, really, if we're going to save the planet. Um, so for me, cooperatives started as just well, you would do it that way, wouldn't you? It started like that. And now for me, I think it is, you know, I think it's got a very important message for the whole world, the cooperative movement has. Yeah. Can you please tell a little bit more about what you mean by a cooperative for those of you who may not be familiar or who may have different understanding of what the cooperative is? So the 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 the, the business we started, Poptel, in, in the 1980s, we were just a bunch of people, really, or just a few of us. And um, I think the idea for us then was very simple, that like many digital businesses, like many tech businesses, we were flat and everybody had an equal say uh, and everybody had an equal stake. 
and initially we we all were paid the same as well although that did change with time um and you know those those are you know cooperative um, those are the sort of things that you find in cooperatives cooperatives are broadly in two large camps really one is those organizations which are owned by their owned and controlled by their employees there has to be some kind of a democracy involved for it to be a cooperative there has to be some way in which as a member of the cooperative you have some say in how it's run so here in the united kingdom a, a, a well known example of that is is the john lewis partnership which is a you know a chain of, of department stores which is owned and and in theory at least controlled by its its workers um, and then um, uh, the other sort is is a consumer cooperative, which is where the, it's the customers that own it. Uh, and um, there are many examples of that across the world. There's a very large one here in the UK called the Cooperative Group. You you see a supermarket on the high street where it says co-op above it, then that's that will be one of those. So essentially, Coptel was a worker cooperative. What would Yes, it was indeed. Yeah. yeah, and uh, can you walk us through a little bit of some of the successes and maybe some of the lessons that you have taken away from being engaged in Poptel? Um, is Poptel still still around? If, uh, just a little bit of history for those who <clears throat> may not be familiar with Poptel. No, Poptel is not still around, although it has some legacy. Uh, in particular, the .dot co-op uh, top level domain, which is widely used across the across the world, as I said before. Um, and a number of co-ops I'm involved in, we have uh, our websites end in .coop uh, rather than .com or .org or whatever, um, and um, which is really useful because it sets it sets us apart from the rest of the uh, of the rest of the business world. Uh, Poptel was was pretty successful. Um, we we became the um, the de facto uh, provider of services to a large chunk of the labor movement in the UK, to some extent, the international labor movement. Um, uh, we we gave the ANC their first email address back in the 1980s. Um, the, the African National Council, right? The National A African National Congress. Yeah, Congress, the, yes. the, the ruling party in 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 South Africa now. Um, and um, uh, we we were also the providers to the the British Labour Party um, in the time in the days of Tony Blair. Uh, we 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 gave Tony Blair his first email address. Um, so that that was fun stuff. Um, in common with many cooperatives, um, the, there was a problem of uh, raising capital. Uh, the cooperative legal structure makes it difficult to raise capital. Uh, not impossible, but difficult. And we needed, uh, at, at around about the turn of the millennium, we were really beginning to take off. The internet was taking off. There was It was the dot-com boom. And we needed some capital to invest in our equipment, which, was, uh, which wasn't really able to keep up with the demand. Um, and... Um, uh, and we were entered into a, an agreement with a, a venture capitalist, essentially, which was normally you would say you can't do that as a cooperative. So what we did is we we set up a company that um, the venture capitalists owned uh, some of and, and the worker cooperative, Poptel, owned the other part of. Um, and that seemed like quite a good idea, but it, it didn't work out. And um, the, the pressure from the the investor to to accelerate growth and um you know really the the investor is interested in rolling dice this is the way that venture capital works you 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 take a you take a quite a high risk very often um for an even higher return and you know you lose companies along the way you lose some of your investment and we became part of that game and it was we were trying to ride a tiger that we couldn't ride um and that that became a problem so we we actually lost control of the business however we were able to rescue bits of it and and bring those back into the movement in particular the dot co-op domain name was rescued and brought back into the movement it's now run by the international cooperative alliance 
with the uh, National Cooperative Business Association in the States. And um, and also the um, the ISP, the retail ISP, people by broadband connections, that sort of thing, um, who was moved into another cooperative called, at that time called the Phone Co-op, which is still providing service to this day. So in, in a nutshell, you were part of the pioneering movement of setting up one of the first worker co-op cooperatives in the internet space, uh, developing or getting a registration for the dot co-op top level domain, which was uh, one of the first or maybe the, the first instance where an organization had owned a top cop, uh, a, dot, a top level domain. So, and then, um, and then the worker cooperative in conjunction with a venture capitalist show that sometimes this kind of uh, collaboration is not uh, sustainable. Would you think that uh, there are some ways in which worker cooperatives can collaborate with venture capitalists in order to raise uh, funding or this is a very difficult relationship? It is. I mean, if 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 I had a um, you know plenty of time, I'd like to have another crack at that uh, because I think that there might have been a way in which we could have made it work. Um, uh, but but I you know I'm doing other things now. I'm still very interested in uh, how we can bring the cooperative way of thinking and the cooperative way of doing things. Uh, you know to involve non-cooperative businesses uh, in, in that. And I, I think for the movement, for the cooperative movement, which is a very big movement, um, you know, estimated to be over a million cooperatives in the world, um, and, and, you know, billions of people literally involved in cooperatives in some way or another, um, uh, I, there is a tendency in the in the, the that part of the movement which does thinking and and you know is aware of what's going on in the world and trying to move you know uh, trying to set policies and so on. There, there is a, a tendency to think to to focus too much internally and not this is my view this is my opinion not to really engage with other businesses out there which actually, you know, can understand some of the value for them, you know, without actually turning into cooperatives themselves of engaging in collaborations on, on based on cooperative principles, principles of equity, self-help, and, uh, you know, according to certain values, uh, including the, the notion of democracy, or, or as I would like to put it, ne neutrality in this, in this case. And, um, you know, I, I think actually what's interesting and what's something that's fascinated me for years is that in the digital and tech space, you're more likely to come across those kinds of, of companies, those kinds of businesses that think that way. You know, you think of, of the classic digital or tech startup, very flat structure, you know, very much a bunch of people working together on something which excites them. Um you know, maybe they become focused on on making a big sale to Google or or whatever. You know, but there are a lot of digital tech businesses out there that that instinctively, you know, understand that there might be some mutual self interest in collaborating on a an, on a, an an equitable basis with other businesses. If we can convince a lot of people of that, that really does help begin to mitigate some of the impact of the current economic system what it's having on people's lives and on the planet uh, in my view uh, so that's why it's worth doing yeah and why uh, what are some of the differences that you see in a company that is run as a cooperative versus non-cooperative or that label them as traditional or investor owned and managed companies why do you think cooperatives have an advantage maybe or what is the difference that you see well um i think uh, not to get to um you know not to intellectualize it uh, too much uh, i think the central point is alienation uh 
you know, if you if you work for a business which uh, you have little control over and you're told what to do, um, and where you know the success of that business uh, is not something that you benefit from particularly, except to perhaps in a vague sense that you 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 might you might get a pay rise at some point then you are alienated from what it is that you're doing. And um, so, the, 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 you know, particularly in a, an employee owned cooperative or worker cooperative, you can, you can break that to some extent because A, because the, the workers have a say over what's going on and B, because they, they can see that they benefit from, from the, uh, the, the commercial, the business success of, the, of, of their employer. Um, but it, but equally with uh, consumer cooperatives uh, where they're owned by their customers, you know they can benefit from the success because the customers feel when they go in the shop or whatever it is, uh, however they engage with the with that business, very often a shop, uh, they feel that you know they're not simply um, uh, providing profits for for distant shareholders. Uh, you know, they feel like it's something th that they have a, a stake in. So that's that's the that's the big cooperative difference. That's the thing that can really make a difference to performance. And there's plenty of academic research to show that, particularly in employee-owned uh, businesses, um, you know, that this does actually feed through to commercial success. It it it's, it's actually you know works. Um, and you know the example I gave earlier, John Lewis Partnership in the UK is famous for its high standards of customer service because the people who are working there care. Um, they have a direct interest in 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 giving good service. And uh, what are some of the criticisms or some of the in in your experience? What have others uh, have criticized? cooperatives for or maybe in your experience what are some of the the biggest challenges that you think you have faced uh, that are unique to cooperatives yeah well the for one thing would be as i've already mentioned the the difficulty in raising capital that's a complicated question we could spend you know half an hour just talking about that um because you know it does raise the question well to what extent is capital really the key thing that you need and I think it's a really interesting debate to be had about that, particularly in the digital and tech sector. If you want to, to launch a startup, is it really money? Is it uh, capital that you need? Or is it the, the, the time and dedication of a bunch of people who write code and who do marketing and, and so on? It's really the latter. And how you get that uh, from those people isn't necessarily with a chunk of money up front. Um, but... Um, the, the the there is nevertheless it would be wrong of me not to not to admit that you know raising capital one of the the co-ops i'm involved in now cooperative network infrastructure i'm really interested in us raising some capital uh in order to uh, to expand our operations um secondly classically people think that cooperatives are di uh, find it difficult to take decisions they they point to um, a um, a problem, a kind of paralysis uh, due to the d democracy. Um, there's some truth in that. I think it's overstated. I think it's uh, those those people who um, yeah, uh, you know are committed to a a more uh, hierarchical uh, investor owned business model. You know, overstate that point. Um, but it's there. Is, there is a little bit of truth in it. Sometimes it, it can be difficult to get decisions made. Sometimes, you know, if if you pay a lot of attention to democratic decision making, I can make you a bit less agile. But I, I, as I say, I think it's overstated. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Now we're going to move to another another topics. The one of the themes of this web that website is democratizing of this channel is democratizing life and democratizing the digital space and there has been a lot of buzz recently about artificial intelligence so this section we're going to discuss about digital democracy and artificial intelligence so 
what do you understand by digital democracy? I'm not sure, to be honest. I mean, I suppose what I would say is that um, I think uh, different people mean different things. What, uh, you know, I've long uh, thought, you know, when the internet was first starting, it seemed to me and many other people that this was an opportunity to increase democracy. That is to say, to increase the extent to which ordinary people could have some control, or collective control over what happens in their lives. Um, you know, either through uh, engagement through their work, uh, you know, for example, with the with the cooperative model, where you might have use the the tools of the internet of uh, of digital uh, communications and uh, information sharing to uh, increase people's ability to participate in decision making, um, or you know at at the level of of the state or or local democracy, um, and I, I think I saw that in in when I was a, a younger person uh, very much as you know being that the more the people had access to information and the more they were able to communicate what it is that they thought was the right thing to do, you know, the, the more feasible it was to, to, to take more decisions democratically and to, to, to involve people more in that, in the decision-making process. And also to, to create the political conditions that would allow that. If you see what I mean, in other words, Poptel from its very early days, the uh, the uh, the notion was that you could use this technology as a way to organise, to campaign, to organise, for example, in the labour movement, to campaign around issues such as human rights and so on. Um, that was all true, but I, I didn't foresee most people didn't foresee social media and the way that that would end up working and and in particular the the uh the the, the effect of the algorithms driving traffic uh in social media which is a a bad effect in my opinion um well, it's not much of an opinion i think most people would would agree so um so I think as time has gone on, the more that I have thought, and I'm not alone in this uh, space, I think, the more I've thought that um, uh, democracy is about more than just knowing what's going on and being able to voice an opinion on it. There is a, an element to it which is about sensible uh, deliberation and creating the right conditions for deliberation and I don't think we're getting near that at the moment I don't think the structure of the internet at the moment and the the way that social media works is encouraging that does uh does ownership matter in the sense this only who owns the social media companies or who owns and controls the internet does it matter I, I think this is a fascinating question, and I, I think it's a very live question in the cooperative movement at the moment. I'm involved in another cooperative called the Customer Union for Ethical Banking. Uh, we're a group of customers who, who are trying to, to bring the, the UK's cooperative bank, which basically had to be rescued by a bunch of hedge funds, to try and bring that back into cooperative ownership, back into the cooperative movement. And for us, that is a very live question. To what extent do we need to own the cooperative bank to bring it in order to bring it back into the cooperative movement? What is a cooperative bank? Is it is it owned by its customers, or or, or is it more important that it's controlled by its customers? And I would say actually it's the latter. Uh, control matters more than ownership, and this is very live question for me now in the work I'm involved in, in particular with. Cooperative Network Infrastructure, which is a, a co-op which has businesses involved in it and parts of the state, local authorities, 
um, parts of the the UK Health Service, which is state run, um, uh, who then share digital infrastructure, optical fiber, data centers, that sort of thing. And for us, you know, it's in a sense, it, it doesn't matter whether who owns a piece of fiber. The really big question is, can you get access to that piece of fiber in, uh, you know, in its raw state? Uh, that matters to public sector bodies. It matters to um, small and growing digital businesses. Uh, so uh, in a sense, ownership only matters because control matters. And if you can engineer ways to control things, and uh, without ownership, fine. Fascinating. Uh, what are your thoughts now on the impacts of artificial intelligence on democracy? And what do you think the future of democracy is in the world of artificial intelligence? Who knows? Uh, I, I don't. I've been waiting for artificial intelligence. I can. I did a course on artificial intelligence when I was at university a very long time ago, um, and you know I thought it was going to come much quicker than it did than it has, and we still haven't got AGI as they say, um, it's artificial general intelligence, gen right? general intelligence. You know, we we still can't cannot. I can't. There isn't a robot that we can go and buy that I can say, look, could you do the washing up, please? And when you've done that, you know. Uh, could you go and look after the next door neighbor who fell over earlier this week? I mean, they're, they're, you know, those um, that we ha we haven't got that far. It's obvious that when we do get that far, and already it's obvious with uh, the um, the the, uh, the generative uh, AI that we've now got, that it changes everything. It changes absolutely everything. Uh, it is it, it it is such a fundamental shift uh, in human history. It's, diff I, it's almost impossible. It's difficult to think of another one that is as great. You know, the advent of agriculture probably is the only one that is up there on the same. Uh, and um, so, how all that works with uh, democracy. It's this was the thing that I don't until we got to this point, really difficult to see this coming. That actually the sequencing of what kind of AI arrives in what order and how that gets used is is crucial to answering your question. And it looks it looks a bit bleak at the moment. Um, you know, but I I you know, most of my life I've thought that. AI has the ability to abolish poverty. Uh, you know, once we can have machines that can do all the things that need doing, um, you know, you 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 could create a utopia. Um, I think what's really scaring everyone now is that. It, Equal is equally easy to see how it could create a dystopia, you know, and and in the and in not just in the kind of, you know, we become slaves of the machine way, or, you know, although that actually isn't a, such a ludicrous thing to talk about now, but but it, you know, in the early, yeah, you know, what the next elections, the general election coming in the United States and in the United Kingdom, you know, to what extent is misinformation? generated by AI going to seriously distort that? And to what extent can we use AI to combat that? To what extent can we use AI to track down um, misinformation and uh, and so on? Uh, I don't know. Uh, really exciting time. Yeah. Can, do you think AI can be democratized in the sense that it can be, can it be used to empower individuals and communities? Do you think cooperatives have a role to play in democratizing AI? Or what do you, what does democratizing AI mean to you and what would it look like? So these are also very difficult questions, um, well, for me anyway. Um, 
there is a sense in which AI, you know, the, the current form of AI enables you to interact with a computer and to get it to do things that previously were the preserve of people who who had to train and learn a very particular way of interacting with a machine. So, and that's that's very democratizing because that means anybody can do that. All you need to do is be able to use natural language. Um, however, uh, you know how we then make sure that um, that that AI, uh, you know, isn't misused. Well, you know, it's the same question that we were discussing just now. I'm firmly convinced that uh, the, some of the notions of the cooperative movement, the notion that uh, there should be a way in which ownership, or if it's not ownership, control, you know, of resources uh, should be democratized in some form, has to be the way that we that we that we proceed because conventional 20th century capitalism is destroying the planet and uh and and also enslaving many people uh now so i'm i'm quite sure there is a role for cooperatives in democratizing ai but i'm not quite sure yet how Fascinating. Uh, so we have many questions to think about and many debates to, to have before we can actually understand how we can democratize AI. Do I will say this, yes. the, and that is that the cooperative movement really needs to get on this now. You know, the, the human race needs to get onto this now, uh, but the cooperative movement certainly does. Well, Sean, it's been a great interview with you. Before we close, I would just like to ask you, do you have any uh, final comments or final message that you would like to share? <laughs> you know, the, 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 the finishing point on the AI, you know, it, it is such a daunting prospect uh, how things will be changing. Um, that, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to think past that. Um, I suppose that the one thing I would just leave want to, to leave the thought with people who may be interested in the relationship between cooperatives and and tech is is the extent to which uh, the internet itself uh, is a is a, is fundamentally a collaborative technology. That's what it is. That that's how it came into being. That's why it's unleashed this incredible wave of innovation on the world, you know, because it said uh, there isn't a central authority here. Obey this set of protocols to connect your network and then you can connect your network to everybody else's network without consideration, you know, without, you don't need permission in order to, to develop a new way of transferring some form of information to another place. That's what's enabled, you know, everything from Wikipedia to to YouTube to 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 Bitcoin, and um, you know that that is at root a a collaborative, cooperative way of doing things, and that's that's why. You know the cooperative way of doing things is 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 right for the future, or is one of the reasons anyway. Well, Sean, thank you very much for the time and for your insights. You have been a a pioneer in the internet space and also in the worker cooperative space. So it's been a pleasure and a privilege to to speak with you. And I hope that the audience has enjoyed this video. So if you if you liked it, please uh, like it, subscribe, and comment. Below. Thank you very much and uh, until next time. Thank you.